everybody, and welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I'm Molly Herford. And I'm Peter Glassford. Today's guest actually is here to talk to us about biathlon, which I feel like sort of combines Peter and my upbringings kind of perfectly. Uh, I was brought up in a very hunting-focused family, so I've been target shooting since I was about seven, and Peter, being Canadian, naturally cross-country skis. So this was sort of the the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. I feel like we could do this as like a tag team maybe and just crush. Perhaps some sort of relay. Uh, Otherwise, it's going to be pretty bad. I've tried cross-country skiing with Peter and it hasn't ended super well, although I'd be willing to attempt it again. That's part of the whole consummate athlete idea. Yeah, and I mean, certainly Daniel Merkert, is who is our guest today, paints a good picture. I mean, it, it sounds like a really exciting sport. He came from a military background. Um, and a water polo background. <laughs> yes, I mean, Funny definitely enough. he's a very good athlete. We talk a bit about his fitness regime. Um, it was a regime? No. Regimen. Yeah, regime yeah. is like, I, I had military on the brain there. Yeah, but. seriously. We'll say regime. Um, but, but indeed, he talks about his fitness and preparation for those multi-sports and just staying fit generally. And he ha- definitely is, is sort of associated with... Um, Tack fit, which is an interesting sort of military-based uh, fitness programming. So very interesting to see sort of what he's into and what he uses to get ready, especially because he's from California, where he's not really based on snow. So we talk a lot about where he goes to shoot and where he goes to ski and things like roller skiing and pole running and, and whatnot to stay fit uh, when he's not on the snow. It's interesting talking to someone who's very competitive in a sport, but lives in an area where they can't really practice any of the actual elements of the sport. He can go to a shooting range, but it's not the same as what he's going to be presented with in the Nordic ski. He's, he's not like, you can't lay down in most shooting ranges. And, and he's not cold and, and stuff too. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't really do like burpees in the shooting range. I think I actually ask about that. Yeah, he said at some, I guess you can. But yeah, definitely you have to be careful how many quick movements you're doing <laughs> in a shooting range. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's a super interesting episode. It, biathlon's kind of been one of those sports that's always sort of intrigued me. And this definitely put me into thinking I might want to try it at some point. Although it's definitely one of, I'd say, the harder sports to get into as far as just the requirements for gear and a place that actually does it, there aren't that many biathlon training centers, especially in the U.S. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it is, it is a lesser known sport, but you know, I think there's a lot of programs, if you are able to get to a place with snow around you know, the world even, um, that are doing that even for masters. I, my impression was that it was more for younger people, but there's you know, programming for, for all ages if you're able to get to those, those areas. But I think the biggest thing is some of the fitness uh, takeaways and sort of practices that Daniel uses. Um, and I think just his enthusiasm for that sort of multi-sport lifestyle is pretty pretty infectious too. Yeah. I mean, biathlon is sort of, I guess, similar to triathlon in that it sort of forces you into a very multi, multi-sport, multi ha-ha, uh, very consummate athlete type of lifestyle, right? Mm-hmm. You kind of have to do, a whole, especially when you don't live somewhere where you can cross-country ski all year round. Daniel's pretty much forced to be a consummate athlete mm-hmm. just to stay in shape for this one specific sport. And I think for a lot of people, you know, the idea of not being able to do exactly your sport all the time uh, resonates. I mean, if you're in the city and you mountain bike or something, you know, a lot of times that's hard. If you're, you know, any snow sport, it's going to be limited, um, especially if you're not in the mountains or in a ski area. So things like using strength training and, you know, dare I say, CrossFit type <gasps> mentality, you know, to simulate things. And I remember riding indoor trainer as a kid and we'd jump off and do burpees or do some sort of strength training to simulate, you know, more of that downhill you know, off-road stuff that we'd have to deal with on our mountain bikes because riding a trainer is obviously very steady and, you know, not mountain biking. Um, so we'd jump off and do burpees and then go right back into riding pretty hard um, to simulate that off-road. So, I mean, Daniel's doing a similar thing by, you know, maybe getting his heart rate up, doing strength training or roller skiing or whatever, and then, you know, practicing shooting or if, if he's able to. Um, but he also talks about you know, they have blanks as well that they shoot, right? So mm-hmm. just different ways to think about practicing your sport more specifically or elements of your sport. Um, yeah, really breaking it down into the tiny elements mm-hmm. and figuring out how to do those elements, maybe not in 
the normal context. Yeah, and I think sometimes that that where you I remember actually the national coach told me this when I broke my collarbone that you know it would be a chance to practice things that I wouldn't in the summer usually. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that case, it actually did mean riding the trainer, but. Um, you know, sometimes that adversity is, is allows us to work on individual things. And I think, yeah, if you're able to ride your bike all the time or, or you know, you're always on the ice playing shinny hockey or whatever your sport is, then, you know, you're not working on things like the strength training or, you know, whatnot. Absolutely. All right, let's get into it. Enjoy our conversation with Dan Markert. Welcome back to the Consummate Athlete. We're here with Daniel, Daniel Markert. Um, who I'm going to get to pronounce his own name here in a second for us, but um, he has been generous enough to talk to us about biathlon today, um, which is the combination of Nordic skiing and shooting, um, which some of our Canadian listeners might be aware of. It's certainly in the Olympics, so if you've watched Olympics, you've, you've seen it. Um, I also but, do you feel like it combines some of our, our youthful passions since Peter is Canadian and therefore a cross-country skier and I grew up hunting. So. I was going to say, I don't know how you're going to combine shooting. That was, gonna get that was good, yeah. wasn't it? Um, yeah, so we're very excited about this. But then on top of that, Daniel's got lots of experience with a couple different fitness systems that I, I hadn't even thought of and we're going to talk about. Um, and get a little bit of info about sort of getting fit generally and then also specifically for sort of biathlon and, and, and again sort of for skiing and, and then also touching on shooting which is an element we haven't had much as far as you know some of those target shooting you know we haven't had archery or anything like that so I'm excited to sort of explore some new domains of, of what it means to be the consummate athlete so Daniel welcome. Uh, thanks it's uh, great to, to be a guest on about uh athletes you're a consummate athlete so i appreciate yeah. that yeah now you're the, the interesting thing is that you're in california so people might be a little shocked about the cross-country skiing so um you know you grew up in sort of the la area and so you you definitely would have had to get out to the mountains to get exposed to cross-country skiing yeah yeah i grew up in uh southern california close to the beach in costa mesa and uh you know kind of typical southern california surfer skateboarder dude uh, competitive swimmer uh, water pole player in high school and college uh, but you know, we got mountains up, uh, you know, eight, nine, 10,000 foot mountains popping up right there on the East, uh, end of Los Angeles basin. And, uh, so there's snow up there. And, uh, when snowboards got invented, I switched from skiing to snowboarding because it was a lot like surfing. So that was only be an hour, uh, hour and a half drive, maybe two hours, depending if you're dealing with some weather and LA traffic, uh, but uh, so yeah, I've done the surf at sunrise and uh, snowboard at sunset, ski at sunset. So, I love so then, that. how did that transfer then to cross country? Because is is there much? I, you know, you have snow, but is there much cross country operations? In the uh, not a lot. Not a lot. Um, there's uh, you know more so with uh, downhill skiing than say snowboarding. But right. uh, uh, you know, I to me, I got into biathlon on a on, on Nordic skate skiing on a on a whim on I saw something on Facebook with our on our National Guard uh Facebook uh, marksmanship uh group and I was like biathlon you're looking you're gonna pay me to go learn how to ski and shoot I'm <laughs> I'm in let me mm-hmm. you know yeah it's a really interesting sport and I've always you know we have a I don't know have you come to Canada at all for biathlon uh no I have not done it uh, I've been to Canada, but not for not for biathlon okay. or skiing or anything. <laughs> yeah, yet. we have, as far as I know, I'm not super well versed in, but I do have a little bit of exposure to the cross country world. So obviously, a lot of the practice for biathlon goes there. And so, Canmore, Alberta has one of our big centers, I think, for the national training. And then there's one nearby here too that I think they're grooming for sort of national uh, or World Cup even level uh, competition here in Ontario, which is actually nearby. Um, so. I've definitely had a, a fair bit of exposure and, you know, they're out there practicing, you know, even when the weather's not good and stuff on the roller skis and different things like that. Um, but it's always seemed, you know, it, as close as that seems and as familiar as I might claim to be, I wouldn't necessarily know how to get into it. Um, you know, it's, it seems like even when you have exposure to cross country ski, they're not really necessarily advertising for it. So it's, it, does it seem like the sports, you know, is, is there opportunities there? Like, do you see, is there any sort of, organization yeah. that's trying to get people oh, into yeah. it so there's big opportunities and i'll uh I, big opportunities depending if you're close enough mm-hmm. to uh one of the places that 
that can do it, right? So in California here, we only have really one uh, one training facility that like has a permanent biathlon range, and pretty much, you know, throughout the winter season, you can do biathlon work. Um, there's a second place, Mammoth, uh, on the Eastern Sierras, that's a little more accessible to Southern California. Um, they do they host a big biathlon competition in the winter, uh, but but they had, they set up a temporary range, so they might have a couple biathlon activities in the winter, but it's it's not something that you could do on a regular basis. I mean, you could do the skiing part, but they don't really have the range set up. Right. And what I say is that there's big opportunities is because it's a small sport, and because the barriers to entry are a little bit high, right? I mean, it's like, it's not easy. It's definitely learning a cross country ski is not easy. But yes, that means that <laughs> that means that the opportunity to like go compete and hang out with like national level competitors is pretty high. Like you, like I get beat, I go and get beat by like Olympic people who either were on the Olympic team or the Olympic development team. Or, I mean, there's like this one guy up in uh, Tahoe, uh, this guy, Dave, he, uh, I, he's, he won the national seniors championship for the United States. So he was like, he's the best biathlete, you know, uh, non-olympic athlete like you know a guy in his late 40s and he just went and won the u.s like national for his age group right for master's wow. level um thing and uh to me that's kind of cool where it's like you know if you want to go run the if you wanted to go through the boston marathon i mean like i mean that's that's a that's a big hurdle to get into right because everybody can go running yeah, I guess that's Everybody. interesting. Yeah, it's hard to do, but I mean, it's sports like, I mean, there was just the Eddie the Eagle movie about ski jumping and there was oh, sort yeah. of a similar argument, you know, that was in the UK. So, you know, yeah. similar thing, like, where are you going to go ski jumping? And so the guy, you know, pursues that and he became, you know, a ski jumper over time and the story's, you know, heart heartbreaking and also makes Adorable. you feel good. But yeah, I mean, with that mission of making it to the Olympics, he wanted to be a downhill skier, I think was the the thing. So, I mean... It's interesting. So, I never thought of biathlon as that opportunity. Yeah. No. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I think it is. Um, I read an article, and where I got the idea from, I read an article about powerlifting competitions. This guy wrote an article, I think, on uh, it was either Strong First or I don't know, T, T Nation or something. And the guy explained that, like, hey, this is a really small sport, and you know, it's kind of got a relative linear progression as you, you know, kind of build your strength up, and like you, you know, it wouldn't. It would only take you a couple of years before you're like you're a, you're in a national competition and you're hanging out with like the people who are the best in the world wow. um, at this yeah. particular sport. And I thought, oh yeah, that's like biathlon, you know, like it's not that big and it's not that easy to get into. Uh, so if you do get into it, if you do commit, then you're like, okay, hey, I'm in. And then it's not that hard. I should say it's not that hard. It's hard. Yeah, but your competition isn't so vast that like you're just lost in the sauce. You can, you can be part of something that's, uh, you know, pretty significant and be up close to, to real world-class talent. And I think that's the interesting thing, right? Like, I mean, even if we, you know, that's sort of just think, Oh, I'm going to go to the Olympics or off the bat, like that's maybe ignorant and, you know, but to be able to have an experience in sport where you get, you know, you can potentially a much more, you know, statistically we could say it was more certainty that you, like you say, you could go and race against the best people yeah. and then perceive or presumably train with really good people and maybe get access to some sports science and coaches and stuff like that. Like that's very hard to do in most sports, you know? Yeah. Yeah. To say that, you know, like, um, you know, one of the, uh, this guy, he's a staff sergeant in the Army National Guard. He's in Utah, but he was on the Army's World Class Athlete Program. He was on the U.S. biathlon team and competed um, at the Olympics in Vancouver, British Columbia, mm-hmm. uh, recently. So, uh, you know, I, I'm hanging out on the range with this guy. So, U.S. Olympic athlete, and this guy's coaching me. That's helping awesome. Me out, him out. Wow. And you're like, and I've seen, and then I see photos every now and then. There'll be some like Olympic, there was some advertisement or something or about, you know, the Army's world-class athlete program. And there's a picture of this guy skiing with his, you know, in Vancouver. And I'm like, hey, I know that guy. <laughs> right. Huh. 
So maybe if we step back, do you want to just give us a brief rundown of what biathlon is? Um, yeah, you know, sort of. Sure. I, and I mean, within that, like what obviously we've said cross country skiing and shooting, but like how how does the competition or the sport like what does that look like? Yeah, so typically it looks like um, it's a multi day. Usually it's a multi day match, right? Uh, for for a regional or national level competition, it's going to be a, a, a multi day match, much like the Olympics. It's like there's a series of events. Uh, a series of races that are going to make up kind of the whole, um, the whole piece. Um, local matches might be, you know, they might just have the one race for the day or, um, or they might have one on Saturday, one on Sunday. Uh, but for, for what we train for and what we practice for going to a regional competition or a national military competition, uh, you're looking at it's, it, it models very closely, uh, the Olympic model, which is you're going to do a 10 kilometer sprint. Um, and they do a random seed of when you start. And then there's like, you know, either depending on whose rules you're following, there's either a 15 second or 30 second, um, delay between racers as they start. And you're going to ski three laps that add up to 10 kilometers. And you're going to shoot twice. You're going to shoot once laying down prone for the first time. And then you're going to come in after that next lap and shoot standing and then you're, you're going to ski one more lap to the finish line, and so that's your 10 kilometer sprint. Yeah. And then everybody gets racked, everybody gets racked and stacked based on how fast they finish that race. And when every time you miss a target, so their targets are in five target strings. So you're going to shoot two five round magazines out of your uh, biathlon rifle, five prone, five standing. And for every miss, you're going to ski a hundred meter penalty loop. So you've got potentially 10 chances to miss so that's a potential extra kilometers it turns into a one kilometer race for you if you're a bad shot um so that that's helps change where you stack up in your um in your finish times Mm -hmm. then the very next very next day is a 12 kilometer for men i'm using men's distances women's have a scale uh like a seven and a half kilometer share uh, uh sprint and then you do a 12 kilometer pursuit. Okay. Well now there's only like a, uh, they Matt, they, the start, everybody's racked and stacked. The fastest guy goes first, followed by the next fastest guy, followed by the next fastest guy. And it works its way down to, you know, however many people, you know, a lot of times, you know, the race last year, we had like a hundred in, in my uh, competitive category, men over the age of, uh, 20 or whatever it is. Um, and uh, and you got like a 15 second uh, separation between you and the guy in front of you, and it's a pursuit because now you're like, I I know I like that's the guy who finished just ahead of me, so maybe I can beat him. Right. And 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 but then you know that the guy 15 seconds behind you, he's about as good as you are too. <laughs> so you're like, I got to stay ahead of that guy. And here's where it gets. This is where it gets into a really interesting, and this is why it's fun as a spectator sport. I mean, in Europe, they have stadiums, and people stack up to watch these things. Because on the pursuit, they double the amount of shooting that you do. So now you have 20 targets, 20 rounds. You're going to shoot twice prone, twice standing, and you're going to ski a total of five laps for 12 kilometers. So now you have twice as many opportunities to miss and do an extra penalty lap. And that is where now you, you miss once, and have to do that penalty lap, and now you're like you just dropped like four or five guys right. behind you. So now like one each round that you like, it's like four or five people that you're you're missing, and you miss two rounds. Now you drop ten places back behind the guy who doesn't miss any, and uh, so that's where it gets really exciting on the on that on that particular race. Um, that's the pursuit, oh, okay. uh, and then for. There's uh we do some team races like a relay, um, and then uh, and then we do a military patrol that they used to do in the Olympics. They, they don't do it that race anymore, um, but being us, uh, you know, when we compete for the national guard, we always do the, the military sure. patrol race, which is a long race, and uh, and you have a patrol leader who uh, gives the firing commands on the range, and he doesn't shoot, and you only have one target to hit. But they give you, uh, like three bo- three bullets to hit the one target, and uh, and you're penalized time for 
if you don't get a one shot, one hit. So if it takes you three rounds to hit it, then you're you're taking a penalty for each each a time penalty. So you have no penalty laps. Um, and there's and there's like if you don't do this, if you don't give the orders right, and if you don't shoot on order, and if you don't shoot in sequence, you know one, two, three, four on the people. There's time penalties, um, and it's a long race. It's like a fifteen kilometer fifteen kilometer race. Okay. So, so, okay. so, so, I mean, that's the competition now. So then, and maybe you can comment on this from, you know, whether that's in the military when you have athletes doing it, or, or just what your knowledge of the athlete or the national teams is. Like, what would a an athlete's week of training look like, you know, for the sport? Because you know, again, similar to ski jumping or bobsleigh or something like it, it's not the type of thing where people see people on cross country skis shooting around. You know, we don't see that like we would see <laughs> runners or you know, hockey players up here or something, right? So, so what does that, how do people do it? Like how, how do you train for biathlon? Yeah. So from a training perspective, I mean, I got to do a lot of dry land training and, uh, um, um, and well, pretty much every biathlete does because if, you know, it's only snow for a couple months out of the year. So what are you doing the rest of the time? Yeah. Right. Uh, and, but even then for me and, and most recreational athletes, right. I mean, the other people that, uh, the civilians, that I meet that do this as their hobby, right? It's a recreational, a recreational athlete. They got jobs. They're working during the week. You know, they got to drive up to the mountains on the weekend to to do their uh, training and practice. So, so your dry land training during the week, you're going to either work on you know strength training, endurance training, uh, or skill training. Right? So, um, and you can do body weight uh, body weight work for strength. And endurance, um, you could use perhaps kettlebells, club bells. I use uh, club bells from uh, Armax International, and uh, for a certain amount of that, running. Obviously, if you want to work on an aerobic base, biathletes or runners. Uh, a lot of them are cyclists, so they like to cycle because um, they can kind of work that, get in that heart rate zone, and work their uh, work the legs and the cardiovascular system without as much you know banging on the joints. That you would with running okay. uh, so that's one way to train roller skis are another uh, big one so they have special uh, special Nordic uh, skate skiing roller skis that look like they're in, like an inline skate they got two wheels and they fit your boot bindings for your skis so it's the same you put on your ski boots and snap in on these roller blades and, and, and do you, you use them very much? I find them just like they just terrify me. I've never <laughs> tried it, which you know. Is uh, really yeah, you know, I can I can totally relate to that. I, I did not use them that much last season for that very reason. Yeah. Um, you kind of you need a good surface, and my neighborhood hasn't had its roads redone recently, so mm-hmm. yeah, there the asphalt's pretty chunky. And there's uh, no there's no brakes usually, right? Like I think some, nah, nope. some models have some sort of brake, but there's not really brakes. Nah, not brakes. So you really need to have a relatively like you can't, gentle. Situation. Yeah, you don't. You want to be able to coast to a stop. So I mean, doing it in subdivisions or something like that's sort of sketchy. You know, you're going to end up jumping into a ditch or something, right? Yeah, it's it's rough. Yeah. Um, so you would. You, I've used it for uh, low at low speed, working really on the technique, right? So you're working the movements of that skate skiing, where you're like, okay, I really want to. I want to work my feet muscles and work the little small intrinsic stabilizer muscles that are around the hips and knees and ankles that don't get strained. They don't, they don't get worked uh, cycling or running. Right. Uh, they really have to be on the, on the roller skis. So the I other thing you can do, though, I was gonna is say, uh, you guys probably ahead. have some longer climbs or something. You could probably go up and then I don't, you'd have to figure I, out how I, to get down. But. Yeah. That is exactly what I was going to go to next, okay, which is awesome. so the guys up in the mountains, right? Okay, so you, it, they live in the mountains. Okay, so there's no f- real flat areas. So, but what they do is they're like, oh yeah, I put my, I take a little camelback, I got my water, and I put my running shoes in my, in my camelback, and I strap on my, uh, you know, my skate skis, and I only work, I do uphill. So they skate ski uphill. That's a workout. At yeah, seven thousand. Let's see level. And then, so they'll go on this long uphill road that's all uphill, and he skate skis uphill, and then takes off his, 
uh, ski boots, puts on his running shoes, runs back down to the bottom of the hill, and then does it again. Right. That's oh the guy gosh. who wins the national match. That's the guy who's the national champion. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't think, like, at a certain point, that specificity is, specificity is important, right? And, you know, I was sort of telling Molly about a lot of cross-country ski training and, you know, there's a lot of dry land and, and whatnot, but at a certain point, you know, cycling isn't the same as cross-country skiing given the upper body component, right? Like, there's and there's a skill to cross-country skiing, so. Correct. Um, when you're limited by the weather, it's tough. Yeah, so uh, for me, what I've done is like, I'm like, okay, I'm going to work on all the strength and conditioning stuff off season or preseason or, you know, at home. And when I get my chance on the snow, the focus of my training on the snow is all technique, right? So I'm like, I'm not, I, I want to be able to spend like all day on the snow <laughs> and not work, you know, wear myself out, you know, trying to be Mr. Speed Demon on the snow because what I, I want to do is I want to spend all that time working the kind of the neurological development on technique um, and, uh, and getting that feel for that whole body uh, skate skiing technique. So that's, uh, that's kind of what you have to do, mm-hmm. uh, particularly as a recreational athlete. And then you would see, you know, at that upper level, those, those people are moving – to the area you know like i mentioned here we have canmore and stuff and then for you guys it would be into the mountains or or whatever um to actually pursue that i would think as a full-time athlete right yeah i mean if that's what you're if you're going down that road mostly right younger athletes right they're thinking like hey i'm gonna i'm really gonna try out for the junior national team or the national team and see if i can get picked up and get a shot at going to the Olympics, right? right? And then that's really where where that type of, you know, live close to it and uh, and do that kind of stuff. Or, you know, you're a lifestyle person like this guy. They, you know, you go and you move up there, you find a job, you know, working the ski lifts or working the, somewhere in the hospitality industry in the area and you spend all your free time. Right. You're a ski easy. bum. You're essentially a ski yeah. bum. Um, interesting. So now you do a fair bit of strength training. Did you want to touch in on sort of what that that looks like? Like what type of routines you're doing? Um, that is what the is that what tack fit is? is yeah, that, tack fits mental, right? Or is that that's uh, it co- covers a lot. Yeah. Covers a lot. It, it's a kind of a pretty sizable uh, training system. It was originally designed by Scott Sonnen for uh, um, his kind of military police. Uh, mostly police. He had a most a lot of contact with uh, law enforcement. He was a coach of the police national police uh, Sambo team. And what he was, you know, what he realized was like, hey, wow, these guys are really these guys can be really good. Their skill levels can be so much higher than younger athletes, and they can sustain such much higher intensity training and competition than younger athletes. But they take like five times as long to recover. Right. Um, and they're really prone to injury because they're bringing with them all this life stress and occupational stress um, from their jobs. So he came up with a way of training that um, that compensated for that and found it to be very, very successful. And it's still very successful. He's doing some very interesting work with the Department of Defense right now. I found it on my way to Afghanistan. I needed something. I was a fat, middle-aged <laughs> Army officer and you know, the traditional, traditional training was not working. And the reason I found out the reason was, was like, I I was not training in like all three dimensions. I was not taking care of my joints. I was not compensating the connective tissues. I didn't know any of that stuff. The army didn't know any of that stuff. The army is just like, Hey, you're getting fat. You need to run more. Um, (laughs) You know, you need to do more pushups and whatever. Right. I mean, that's the army's answer. You're just not running enough. Uh, But the, problem is you end up over specializing in only a small number of physical movements mm-hmm. and you're very prone to injury and illness. And so what happens is most people, I was, I fell right in the track with a lot of guys I, I know in the, in the military and that, you know, they're in their late thirties and they're like, man, I got to do more. And they do more and it lasts for like six weeks and then boom, something get the ankle, the knee, the shoulder, something gets tweaked or you catch 
a, a, a cold and you're knocked out with a sinus infection or respiratory infection or something hits you somewhere between six and eight weeks. And that's because no, no work is being done on taking care of the connective tissues, the joints, um, you know, uh, and you're just, and, and no rotational training. So you've just got all these imbalances. So TACFIT addresses that. So what I found there, I managed to salvage myself in my year in Afghanistan and survive those big mountains full of snow and, uh, and not get blown up. So it was good. And uh, I came back and I dove in head first. Cause I was like, this is the first time in my life I've been able to train like every day consistently for an entire year. And like, I've lost like 30 pounds. This is crazy. So I became a certified instructor in that to mostly to bring it to the military and train the units I was part of, uh, which I have, uh, you know, the, We've reduced injury rates and uh, increased fitness performance scores without having to do a lot of running and uh, push-ups and sit-ups and save that for the test that the Army still sticks with. Yeah. But, they, ha- they haven't pulled the sit-up yet? I heard that was coming. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, you know, they're actually pretty good about they've kind of pulled the sit-up from the training portion, but they oh, still okay. test it. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's a physical demand. Like, I can see, like, you got to test something, but. Well, you got to test something that uh, you can test quickly, a large number of people, and it doesn't cost you any money. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. that's, they're kind of stuck there. Yep. But so I took TACFIT, and it's a subset of circular strength training system, which kind of addresses that joint mobility, joint health, uh, six degree strength, and the compensatory stretch in the yoga side of it uh, to compensate for either your occupation and then your training. Um, and then I took that and applied that to like, okay, well, I want to do biathlon. I got to, you know, I can work on it here. I can work on, I got to work on these issues uh, for strength. And I got to work on these issues for mobility. And what I learned was when I'm done training and skiing, like, oh my gosh, I have got some compensatory work to do because that really smoked my glutes, quads, and, you know, whatever else that, you know, cross country skiing really, it's a whole body thing, but it really mashes your glutes and quads. And your and your upper body too. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I found my you know I had a lot of performance improvement last season by spending a couple months in the summer focused almost exclusively on my mobility restrictions in my hips and uh, and my lower back, and that really allowed me to ski a lot better. So that's a fairly common complaint, you know, that low back pain, high hip pain, you know, is there a specific move that you, you know, you really found was beneficial or that you sort of include regularly now if you're sort of time crunched? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, so there's a, a, a series of moves that, uh, with a shin box switch. Um, I don't know how I can describe it verbally, but, um, we can also look up a video and uh, yeah, link to it. Yeah, look up a video, like shin box switch. And there's a bunch of things you can do while you're in that shin box. Uh, you can fold yourself over your, put your chest to your knee, and you can uh, reach uh, the forward arm out, extending it to put an additional stretch on uh, on the on your uh, back line that connects to your hip and comes off your uh, hip and diagonally across your back. Uh, so. Yeah, that actually really made a lot of difference. Uh, shoulder bridge, you know, or angled shoulder bridge, that that uh, that helps a lot, especially compensating for the running and skiing. Um, uh, side lunges I found were very helpful for uh, compensating for the skiing side of it. So when I was done, you know, the day after skiing, you know, I do a lot of side lunges. Might do weighted side lunges with a kettlebell or a club bell. Okay. So yeah, the the hip mobility uh, for a lot of sports, for life in general, is really important. We spend so much time sitting. I'm sitting now. I should probably be standing while I'm doing this interview. But uh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, you can see on on YouTube all kinds of stuff. All kinds of people are pushing uh, uh, good hip mobility um gymnastic strength but you know coach somner over there he'd, yeah he he'd seems to on, be getting pretty popular for sure um big on that yeah yeah and that's definitely the thing right is you know 
you try and get into those shapes you want to be in, but you know, there's a getting below your chair or getting into a lunge stance or standing up, you know, that's, that's mobility of that hip for sure. Um, that's good though. I, I found a link here, so we'll put the shin box split in there. That's a, a new one. I think I haven't seen that variation of that position. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's a good one for sure. Um, as far as shooting, I don't have a lot of expo exposure. I actually just shot target shot. We went uh, clay shooting when I was down in Arizona with some friends, uh, over the winter and it was pretty cool. I liked it. It was a neat experience. Um, do you have any, you know, where, where would you recommend someone go again? You know, we can't all get to a biathlon range. So where, where does someone go to get some exposure to shooting that would then help them once they did find some biathlon? Um, yeah. So, um, so the biathlon uses a bolt action 22 caliber, uh, 22 long rifle. Uh, so very affordable ammunition, although they do use precision high match grade ammunition. So that's a little more expensive. But if you're just getting started, you don't need match grade ammunition. So yeah. you could buy the really inexpensive 22 caliber long rifle ammunition, and you can start on any kind of uh, 22 caliber uh, uh, rifle, preferably a bolt action. But uh, just because that would, you know, get you used to that kind of motor activity of, you know, hey, you got to, you know, reset the right. bolt after each shot. But, uh, so I, you know, I don't have access. There's no biathlon range I can go to that's nearby. It's like three hour drive up in the mountains. So, you know, I go to either an indoor range, uh, cause there you could, that's standing, you know, most people are shooting pistols in an indoor range, but you can adjust the distance of your target. And I, you know, I print out on my printer scaled circles, uh, you know, for shooting the target biathlon target is at 50 meters and you're looking at an eight centimeter circle, uh, and that's the target when you're standing. So you can scale that, cut it in half, have a four centimeter circle at 25 meters, which would be you know, a typical indoor range, uh, 25 yards. So it's not quite meters, but it's close enough um, for what you're wanting to do. And you can work on your standing, although probably better to work on prone first. But uh, but you know, hey, whatever whatever you feel like you want to get into and whatever you're going to go work on. Mm -hmm. And I would work on, one, I would work on one thing at a time. Right. Now uh, really most ranges probably don't, aren't set up for laying down though. They true? aren't. That's uh, that's, that's a challenge trying to find a, uh, a range where you can lay down. I don't have one nearby that I can really go lay down on. So I'll, for me, prone, I do a lot. Of, I'll do prone dry fire. Uh, so I'll just set up a, a scaled target uh, that I've printed out in my garage and I lay on the floor in my garage and I dry fire and I practice going through my five shots. Okay. Um, in fact, I'll even do that. I'll do that in, during my recovery periods during a workout. Right. So I'll be, I was doing a 30, 30, 30 seconds of work, 30 seconds of recovery. In the recovery, I drop down, get behind my rifle. Dry fire, work on controlling my breath, mm -hmm. and then get back. So now dry fire, that's like a, a blank or what it what, what No, it's just uh, empty chamber, it's just no bullets, no ammunition, you're just um you're just going through the motions, right? So, so how do you so you don't know if you're hitting the target though? Correct. Okay. You don't. You're you're working on your mechanics of relaxing um, and loading and relaxing and loading and having a good sight picture that you're have a front sight focus, that the target is blurry, that you're clearly focused on the front sight. And that you have a smooth trigger pull. And really what you're looking for in dry fire is that when you pull the trigger, nothing really moves. That you know, There's no wobble. Um, and that's what you're practicing. Yeah. Um, and you want to get those repetitions in. You always want to get that in rather if, you know, before you go to the range. So before you go to the range, you do some dry fire, mm -hmm. then go to the range. Uh, work on it's interesting a lot of sports on. have some sort of element like that not to the the degree of separation that maybe biathlon does where you're drilling it in a very cardiovascular sport and then you know laying down or standing up and doing something as like isolated and you know uh i guess focused maybe but you know in something very technical i'm trying to think of an example like a motocross or something you know you have to be going really really hard and then suddenly you're hitting a jump or cornering or something like that and that same level of focus is important but a lot of times people will make the mistake of not practicing, you know, under duress or at race speed or, or different things like that. So that's, 
an interesting way for you to definitely experience that heart rate up and breathing hard and having to change focus to a very narrow focus, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because you're, uh, you're really wanting to practice and habituate the attentional switching that's required to go from, you know, that, um, you know, with skiing, you know, probably you're uh, internally focused uh, with broad concentration because your work, you're, you're focused on that technique. Um, I mean, you're having to do attentional switching while you're skiing too. You got to pay attention to the terrain and, you know, am I coming to a downhill and uphill where can, how am I going to handle this curve? So you're doing some switching there too, but when you get to the range, I mean, now you're, you're definitely having to do that. Okay. I got to get this heart rate down fast and I have got to really calm myself down and bring my focus to that, you know, alignment, that's front sight post, getting that thing aligned and smooth on the target and a smooth trigger pull and then everything's stable. Yeah. And that, and that if anything goes wrong, that's in the past. And the only thing that's going on is what's the next action. Whatever, you know, so they're focused only in the now, not thinking about what just happened or what's about to happen or how many penalty laps you got to ski now. Yeah. Um, that, that's the, that's part of the, for me, the really fun part of the sport is, it really challenges you to center and be focused on the now and to, and to let go of any attachment to what just happened or what's about to happen. It's so funny. We just talked to somebody uh, who coaches Krav Maga yesterday, and we were talking to him about how it's kind of – what he was describing is really similar to that, where it's kind of like this uh, active mindfulness practice. So everyone's really into this yeah. like, seated meditation, but I feel like – you know, my memories of shooting, yeah, was very much that. Like you're just in the now, and the target's all that matters. Yep, yep. For I, I do. I, I train Krav Maga as well, so I can totally appreciate that. Um, and perhaps there's a reason I, I am involved <laughs> in those kind of sports and activities because it is. It's, it's. Here's my, my. The movement is my meditation. Right. So mm -hmm. the, having to be under physical. Uh, duress or under physical activity and having to control the mind and focus on the technique and then not uh worry about what's coming next or what just happened right. yeah um, it's good practice it's good yeah practice. exactly that has so many good applications for you know real life as opposed to i don't know i'm terrible at seated meditation i'm sure i'd be i'd do you know like it would help me if i could do it but i can't so i like anything where it's like no you can be active and still kind of meditate so i love yep. this okay so here's uh, my question when you go to sure. the range when you're at the range shooting do you ever just like drop and do like burpees or something that would get your heart rate up and like get you kind of out of the the zone so that way you have to practice getting back into it and calming down uh, you know, I've been able to do that on military ranges, but there's no real civilian range where the, <laughs> I feel like, like that yeah. would get you in trouble. Yeah, that might yeah. get you at least some weird looks for sure. Yeah, yeah. There's there's probably there there's a few uh, there's probably there's some, there's some breathing drills and probably some stuff you could do with your upper body um, that you could probably get away with, uh, but um, I kind of let. I leave that kind of training for uh, my dry fire training yeah, girl, and, yeah. and when I'm actually at a, a biathlon range. And at that point, then it's no problem. You just, you go uh, typically like at a, at this one at Auburn ski club in, uh, in Truckee in Lake Tahoe, um, you know, it'll, they'll have a biathlon clinic or the range will be open for a couple hours on Saturday. And, you know, you're able to go and you zero, you confirm your zero and then you'll ski some lap. You'll ski a lap. You'll ski a loop and come back and then shoot a five target string and then get up, ski a lap, come back and shoot. So you get that heart rate up, not at race speed, but you're going to get it up and you're just going to go through that regimen of practicing. Um, um, my heart rate's up and I'm practicing getting it down. It's up, I'm getting it down. And, um, and you do that over and over again, get those repetitions in, work your techniques, and then you kind of gradually – increase that uh level of stress arousal from the activity pushing yourself and uh see how well you how well you can do and bringing it back down yeah that uh, makes sense um i think one of the things we wanted to ask you about was tips for first time uh people that just have never shot a gun in their life and think this sounds cool uh 
Yeah, so walk us through that first time and how someone can, I don't know, go to the shooting range and feel comfortable. And and maybe not even the whole process, but just like one or two sort of like common cues or or mistakes people make. Like you mentioned breathing out or something just as you're you're shooting. Like what are some of those key sort of basics? Yeah, so so here's a lot of what I see, you know, when I go to the range, I you know go to the civilian indoor range or an outdoor range or whatever, and I, you know, and I see novice shooters. Um, uh, I think probably the best thing you do would be take a class and get a coach. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, go go ahead and and kind of put the ego aside and 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 maybe and invest, right? If you're going to do it, I would really recommend. You know, invest the whatever that it fee is for that hour of instruction. Get the guy or gal who's the instructor to to coach you through the kind of body mechanics of establishing a good stable firing platform and how to manipulate the firearm, whether that's a pistol or a rifle or whatever. But you know, if you're looking at the biathlon rifle and you want to work on that 22 long rifle rifle marksmanship, you know, a lot of these, uh, especially indoor ranges, uh, you know, you can rent the gun you can go and say hey i want to rent a gun Mm -hmm. um and they'll rent you the gun and you just go in there and kind of on your own but when i see people do that i see a lot of bad body mechanics and their posture is wrong and their uh their grip is wrong and so it's very difficult to uh shoot accurately if you don't have good body mechanics and and then of course I mean, there's training scars, so whatever you repeat becomes more easily repeatable. So if you, you know, repeat bad technique, then it takes that much longer to undo the the neurological damage, so to speak, of yeah. you know practicing the wrong way. So if you're if you're a novice and you're wanting to get into this and you're like, hey, this sounds cool, you know, I've got some background in skiing, you know, why don't I try this? Um, I mean, the best way to do it would be to show up at that at that biathlon club um, that they have. Um, in most of the snow, uh, states that if they have snow, there's probably a biathlon club, however small it might be, that is co-located with a cross country skiing center. Um, Mm -hmm. I know up in Washington state, they've got, uh, they have at least one, um, up on the kind of North of Seattle and in the mountains kind of cascades up there. They have one, Oregon has a a place um i know vermont obviously is a, where the national guard has their biathlon headquarters there's a civilian biathlon club at the exact same place um outside burlington vermont and uh minnesota is a big biathlon state so you should have no problem finding and michigan and, uh those snow states in the, the snow belt in the midwest mm-hmm. they've got they've got a colorado has a biathlon Utah, Utah has got Soldier Hollow. Um, they've got a nice. You know, they're getting ready. They're going to bid for the, some upcoming Winter Olympics. Salt Lake City is going to go for it again. I hear. Ooh. So, so they're investing. Um, uh, the other thing to do, you know, might be like, hey, you're uh, you're on, you're going, you're doing a snow vacation, and why not? Yeah. Put that in. Put that into your plan and say, you know what, you know, my next vacation and i'm not just going to do kind of the this one thing whatever i do you know i'm, I'm not just going to do downhill skiing you know i might take a, a a day off in the middle of the ski week and i'm gonna i'm gonna go look up the biathlon club at uh wherever i'm at wherever you're going yeah for so. sure i love that and i think kind of the the other thing we wanted to touch on today was talking about that mental toughness because i mean realistically you could have kept being a surf bomb and you know yeah. done your your marksmanship stuff but you kind of took like the hard road i mean cross-country skiing is a really hard thing to do if you've never oh. done it before holy crap i started it last year and it was awful awful yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. We, we haven't we haven't exposed Molly to hills yet. Keep in mind. Yeah, this oh. is flats, and I hated it. <laughs> oh my gosh, really? Okay, so you haven't experienced the hills yet. I oh, was God. so grumpy the whole time, and I think it's just because I could run it faster than I could ski it, and yeah. I just hated having to be slow and trying to do technique. And Peter's just going glide, glide, and I'm like, right. I can't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's uh, you know, mentally challenging. Uh, Shooting's like all mental. So yeah, mental toughness. So I think, I think you, I mean, 
I don't know, probably a lot of your listeners, because people who want to listen to the consummate athlete, if you want to be a consummate athlete, you probably have some uh, personality flaw that, uh, you know, <laughs> you, it causes you to want to, you know, seek out that suffering to, yep. um, to come through the other side to be better than you were before. And I, to me, that's the draw, right? I, mm-hmm. I know that to be better, to be a, just a better person, to be a better version of me, I'm going to have to pass through some amount of suffering. I got to pay the price to be better at whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm. And to get, to get better requires effort, requires sustained effort, um, particularly if it's any kind of skill, it's going to retire sustained, um, skillful technique, good technique. Um, so that mental toughness starts with just ad- admitting that, like, and acknowledging that hey, it's going to be hard. I know it's going to be hard. In fact, I really wouldn't want it any other way because I won't, I won't be as better on the other mm-hmm. side if it's not hard. So that was one of the draws for me. I mean, it's kind of, I'm, I'm an infantry officer. That's a hard thing to do in the army. It's like, that's a lot of time on your feet, a lot of weight on your back. It's dangerous. Uh, so, uh, you know, but there's a lot of benefit on the other side of coming through and saying that, Hey man, I can't believe I just did that. I covered that distance, um, you know, with this amount of weight and whatever. So with skiing, um, it's very humbling because you're going to spend a lot of time falling. Slippery, snow is slippery. You're going to fall on your butt, fall on your face. Um, so from a mental toughness perspective, there's a reframing that it goes on. It's like, you know what? This is a great way for me to like get past ego. Right? Like, mm-hmm. Ego is the enemy. I, this is a great way for me to do battle with my ego and put it behind me because I am going to look stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I cr- cross-country skiing, even at the elite level, is sort of odd looking. I mean, I'm a yeah. cyclist, so we don't dress much different. But watching, like, elite cross-country skiers coming down hills is just such a precarious, like, you uh-huh. know, you're just thinking that there has to be a better way to do this. And they're just sort of like holding on for dear life, screaming around oh. corners and stuff. It's pretty crazy. I, I had a horrible experience. Last year, last year at our national championships on the pursuit day, so the tw- at the end of the 12-kilometer race, I crashed like 30 feet in front of the finish line <laughs> because I pushed it just a little too hard because I wanted this really I was, wanted, I was pushing it. I'm like, this is it. I'm done. I'm on the final stretch. I'm and I was feeling good on my technique, and I just pushed it a little too hard. I went right over the edge, and I lost my balance, and I caught an edge on my ski, and I couldn't regain it. And I had one of those long, wobble, off-balance, fall flat on your face. And I was going fast, so I slid. And I was hoping I was going to slide across the finish line because we had those old ankle timers on. And, oh, my uh, gosh. <laughs> and, and no, I stopped like eight inches from the finish line oh with my, my face. Gosh. <laughs> I'm like, not so here's the not quite so photo finish. And uh and it hurt, right? You know, bam, it's grinding on yeah. the ice. And uh so I had to do like I just basically flipped my skis over so that my timer would trigger across the finish line. <laughs> so nice. it stopped. I, but wouldn't you know it? Of course the public affairs guy's there and there's a photo of me on the National Guard, you know, def, you know <laughs> you know, defense, you could go on the defense visual information system and you can probably, you can find a picture of me face down at the finish. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love uh, that you uh, like uh, actually though had the mental like awareness to be like, no, I've got to get this timing chip across the line. What's the most efficient oh, yeah. way to do oh, that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I did basically, I did like a, you know, a crunch and a, and a, and a roll, right? Yep. I did a, a roll and I'm like, I'm getting that foot across the line. And I'm like, that timer's got to stop. Yep. I love that. Most people would be trying to like get back up and like hop across the line or like do like the pull themselves with their hands. But I like that that's a very efficient use of your, <laughs> saved you a few seconds. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say the tack fit really helped with uh, developing the mental toughness because uh, the, the six time protocols that are in the uh, flagship product of tack fit 26 um, kind of take you through the um, the physiological and the psychological uh, phases of uh, of really holding your technique and uh, recovering your breath and kind of working on all the I want to call it the 
putting into procedural memory, that's probably the technical way to put it, putting it into your procedural long-term memory, the ability to recover so that it's automatic, so that you're just automatically recovering. As you get, as your stress levels come up, as your uh, fatigue starts to cause you to falter, you adjust your posture, you adjust your technique uh, to bring the heart rate back down and regain control of your breath um, so that you're not having to really waste too much conscious thought it's kind of built, it's kind of, uh, I would call it kind of baking in your mental toughness so that it's mental toughness is automatic. So it's less mental. So you can focus your mental toughness on other things. Um, uh, particularly with in biathlon focusing on that, that marksmanship or I'm focusing on making that decision of, you know, which, you know, am I doing V1, am I switching to V1 or V2 uh, skate skiing technique or how am I going to handle this hill? Sure. Uh, I like that. And it's, I feel like it's not really about becoming a, a consummate athlete so much as a consummate person, because I feel like so much of that mental toughness crosses right back into your work life and everything else. Right. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I totally do that. I mean, I've had to do that, you know, I've, it, at work I've had, you know, I remember two years ago in the national guard, I thought I was about to have my retirement moment where they're about <laughs> to fire, they're about to fire me and I'm going to have to retire. Um, you know, I was in charge of an operations center. We were doing a Big, huge exercise preparing for a potential earthquake. I mean, there's like all kinds of people coming from all over the country to this big exercise. And my team, I was new at the job. We had some new people, and we totally screwed up this PowerPoint slide <laughs> presentation that we were supposed to do the morning operations briefing. And I'm the operations officer, and I'm about to get up there. And this other staff people, this thing was totally screwed up. And thankfully, the commanding general wasn't coming in on day one. He was coming in on day two. But it sucked, and I got told, okay, you got one more chance to fix this because if this isn't right tomorrow morning when the general's here, you're done. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and I, yeah, so I'm like – and it was one of those moments where I was like, well, yeah, absolutely because this really sucked, and if I was him, I'd fire me too. <laughs> um, and I'm like, okay, so we got to recock and figure out, you know, I got to change some people around. This person's going to be in charge of that. And I had to like – you know, and you're standing. Nobody wants to stand in front of a room full of – important people that you've especially people you've known for a long time and mm -hmm. they've all respected you and they picked you for this job because they thought you were a good guy and then it like totally sucks and now you're <laughs> like i gotta do it again tomorrow so i totally took all those mental toughness things all that, the stuff from fit you know i'm like well, i'm working on my breathing skills <sighs> while i'm up there dealing with these screwed up powerpoint slides and, and uh and then for the next day you know i'm like okay i just need to not think about uh what just happened, we're going to focus on what we're going to do next, and we're going to focus on next actions. I'm going to focus on checking this guy, and we're going to make sure that this thing's the right way. And if this thing's dorked up at this particular time, we're going to switch to plan B so that I'm not caught not knowing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, yeah, I think those – and for sure, when I was done with that day, when I went back to my hotel room, I like I did a workout. <laughs> yeah. Like, I got a lot of stuff I got to burn off right now. Oh, we're going to work through this. I know exactly what I need to do. I need to rebalance these neurotransmitters. We're going to bring this cortisol levels down. We're going to do some deep breathing and yoga when it's over, and then a hot shower, and then we're going to hit back, get back on the computer. I love so, that. So, yeah, this being a consummate athlete really is a pathway. It's a vehicle for you, a platform to become a consummate person. Right? I mean, that's probably what you guys would uh, – Definitely. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, probably. definitely. There's a lot of skills that have come from ath athletics, I guess, that transfer over. And like you say, most of it is dealing with nerves or focus or, you know, focusing in when, you know, things aren't going super or dealing with adversity and, you know, all this stuff helps for sure. Great. Um, so I guess the only other thing I want to follow up on just to finish here. So you you have TACFIT and you're, you own a, a personal training business and it's called Invictus 6. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, okay. that's what uh, I'm doing. I'm doing some uh, it's probably you know, mostly part-time. I got part-time National Guard, part-time fitness coach. And, I like it. You got a lot of a lot of plates in there. We, we appreciate yeah. people like that. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah. so, so in there, you're doing TACFIT. So now can you sell me a bit here on TACFIT and why it's different than other fitness routines that we might not name? But right. what, what sets it apart? from those other, you know, just high intensity, you know, strength training type things. Right. Probably the biggest thing that sets it apart is that it waves the intensity. So it's taking you through, you're going to have a no intensity day, right? 
So you're keeping your heart rate below 40% of maximum, and you're going to focus just on your joints, joint health, joint mobility, open chain mobility, closed chain mobility, and you're going to work on uh, the, the, the inner fascial tissue that wraps the joints. That's really what it's about. You're taking care of your joints. Then you're going to have a, a low-intensity day that's going to go for taking care of the outer fascial layer that wraps the muscles, that uh, provides you that uh, hydrostatic shock and hydro, hydraulic shock, hydraulic bounce. I think that's what it's called. Right? Your fascia provides you a lot of energy. Um, but you got to take care of it um, because it adapts and hardens based on your the things you do the most, right? So if you sit the most, then your fascia is laying down collagen to harden to make you a, the best sitter in the world. Um, you're like a world class sitter. Uh, <laughs> so you got to you got to undo that. So TACFIT is like got these programmed days in and these programmed exercises that are matched. They're also matched not just to like from a general physical preparedness purpose of trying to undo your occupation or your lifestyle um, habits, but then they're also matched to the exercises you're going to do on that third and fourth day on that medium intensity day and your high intensity day. So attack fit then takes you into, and it depends on which type of program you're doing within tack fit. It, it almost doesn't really matter from a conceptual standpoint. We're looking at, Hey, you're going to progress in motor complexity through the six degrees that your body moves, right? Because it can, you know, it can hinge and up, go up and down, but it can also rotate um, around the hips and the spine, right? So this rotational strength right. is what you're going to want to work on. And uh, it has built-in progressions, you know, usually three or four levels of difficulty that, that once you've kind of mastered the motor movements, which typically take about a month, but sometimes, and it depends on where you're at, it might take you longer. Mm -hmm. Uh, but once you've kind of mastered that level of motor complexity at that resistance level, whether it's body weight or with a, you know, dumbbell or a kettlebell, you know, you're able to move on to the next level of motor complexity. Uh, and then you would do that on a moderate intensity day of 60 to 80% heart rate. So then that keeps you in a dopamine and norepinephrine dominant state, create, you know, learning neurotransmitters. That's really good for, uh, uh, kind of keeping you ready to be mentally sharp. And then you do that one high intensity day where you're going to push it above 80%, um, somewhere between 80 and a hundred percent. And that purpose there is to reset your, uh, autonomic nervous system so that when you stop the exercise and you do the cool down, you're telling your neuroendocrine system that like, okay, Hey, look, stress is over. And when stress is over, we're going to take it all the way back down to baseline, which is really great for people who have like, You know, if you got a chronic, you're exposed to a lot of chronic stress in life, um, you're going to want to periodically take it up to high intensity and then bring it down. But you don't want to do high intensity all the time because then you're going to overtrain, right? And you get adrenal fatigue, you have too much cortisol, and life's life's too hard that way. So with TACFIT, you can either do it on a four-day wave or a seven-day wave uh, where you got, you know, either one high-intensity day every four days or one every seven. I like that term wave. I've not heard it, you know, that it's basically how you're going to periodize your micro cycle, but that's a good sort of way to think about it is, you know, that wave uh, visualization is very neat. I like that. Yeah, because, right, I mean, we've got, uh, I mean, your your body's already operating on a ultradian pulse, on a circadian rhythm. You know, you've got a day rhythm and a night rhythm. Um, and within the day, you've got your rhythm, 90 minutes of going up and then 20 minutes down. And then even within the week, uh, you've got, you know, Wednesdays for most people, they have a peak productivity day on Wednesday. So that wave is uh, waving and waves on the month. I read uh, in the book Power of When. I got, I were, actually, there's a wave where we have a hormonal wave synced to the lunar cycle. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. No, that's, um, that's a thing I think women have been probably more aware of for – right. Most of our lives since it's, you know, monthly and everything. But I think it, yeah, is for everybody. You, you read about this male PMS now. And... I guess. I don't know about this. <laughs> Peter looks really upset right now. Um, yeah, no, I think there's there's certainly something to that. I think there's a lot of stuff going on in our world we don't we don't know about. But I think on the greater screen, I think there's, you know, we, we put ourselves into cycles, whether that's the work week or, you know, the, the just every day, the, the 
change of the daylight and stuff too. I think there, there, right. ha, there has to so, be something to that, right? So the sales pitch for TACTED, I mean, what I, and it's a subset of circular strength training. So, it's, you know, there's other ways of, of programming that same thing. It's not, it wouldn't be TACTED. TACTED's got, because it's working on these um, six different time protocols and you're working on this kind of neuroendocrine conditioning within the context of waving that intensity. So there's a couple different ways to do it. But this, to me, it's like, hey, this is a way to synchronize your physical activity to the rest of your life so that there's no off days. So every day you're doing something, every day you're moving mm-hmm. to make yourself better. Yeah, and that's, a right. tough, that's a tough concept to get people into. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly with all my cycling clients, it's we got to be doing something every day, right? And it doesn't have to be you know, the, the killer workout that leaves you plastered for another three days after, but you know, that frequency is important. Um, that's awesome. I think so much there, Daniel, thank you so much for coming. You know, you're another person who I think we'd love to have on again to talk, you know, drill in on something a little more specifically or talk about another one of the plates you have up in the air, but slash I'm now really worried. We're going to have to uh, bug you to take us to that biathlon place in Tahoe when we're in California. I I mean, maybe for the biathlon, if we can arrange that, but I think at the very least we'll, we'll give you a ring when we're, we'll be back up for sure in April into the sort of San Jose, um, Monterey sort of area so we'll, we'll bug you then if we're if we get up here sure. again um, for a strength training workout maybe or nothing else Absolutely. a coffee meet face to face but mm-hmm. thank you so much for taking the time so Daniel's website is uh, Invictus 6 and the 6 is not spelt it's the number 6 so N-I-N-V-I-C-T us org. that's dot org not dot com and we'll put that in the show notes uh, Daniel any other links that we can give people uh, yeah, you can, yeah, you can find Invictus six on Facebook as well. You can find me on Facebook at Daniel dot marker, Facebook dead slash Daniel dot marker. Thanks so much for tuning into the consummate athlete podcast. Uh, to check out all of the show notes for this episode, you can head over to consummate And we would love to hear from you about what you thought about the podcast. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Molly J Herford and at Peter Glassford. And we would also love it if you would pop over to iTunes and subscribe to the podcast so you can tell every time a new episode and new sport comes out. And if you would leave us a review, let us know how you're, how you're liking it, how we're doing, if there's anything you'd like to hear more of, that would be amazing. And you can find us over on Facebook now, uh, facebook.com backslash consummate athlete. Thanks again for tuning in and we will see you next time.